Now, how many people actually go into the lemonade business? A lot of kids try their luck at, lemon, at lemonade stand at some point. Some even have a certain level of success with it. Maybe you were one of them. Any of you have success with a lemonade stand? But most people outgrow the desire to sell lemonade on the street corner. But there are really professional lemonade stands out there. You can usually find them at county fairs or at amusement parks. And some of those stands operate year round. So logic would dictate that some kid somewhere came up with the idea of turning a sidewalk lemonade stand into a full-time business. Maybe it started one hot summer afternoon after seeing some of the other kids in town doing it. He thought, hey, this could be an easy way to make extra money. He got his dad to help him set up a rickety little stand. He talked his mom into giving up some of the frozen lemonade concentrate that she had in the freezer. Or if he is a California or Florida boy, maybe he went out in the backyard and actually picked the lemons off the tree and made fresh squeezed lemonade. The first day was successful. So he tried it again and again and again. Then one day he got invited to bring his lemonade stand to a middle school baseball game. And before long, he's upped his price to $2 a glass. Partly because his mom has now started charging him for the sugar and other supplies that are going into it, and she insisted that he buy his own blender. And partly because he finally got smart and realized people will pay more than 50 cents for a really good glass of lemonade. Things keep progressing. Pretty soon he's got a lot of invita invitations to bring his lemonade stand to all kinds of events. He's getting really busy taking his lemonade stand all over town. Sure, he's making a really nice profit, but he starts to realize that things aren't as laid back as they once were. It's taking up more time than he expected. He's going through so many lemons that he has to special order them now. Even the local supermarket doesn't have enough lemons for him. The city found out about his little business, and now they demanded that he get a business license. He also has the health department checking up on him to make sure he's meeting all the local health codes. What started as a little hobby has now become a full-time investment, a full-time commitment. And in that moment, he has to make a choice. Is this going to be a hobby or is it going to be a career? He's got more invitations than he has hours in the day. Is he, is he going to hire a few employees to share the load? Of course, then he has to worry about payroll taxes and a whole other mess of things that he's never had to deal with before. So what's he going to do? Some of you out there are thinking, maybe I should go into the lemonade stand business if it's that successful. Others are thinking, I wish that was my kid. I wish he'd have something productive to do and get off the couch. Well, there's a moment when we all have to make a decision. Is this going to be a hobby or is it going to be a career? Is this something I'm going to do part-time or am I going to dedicate my life to this? Is this just for fun or is it something more? These kinds of moments aren't unique to the business world. I think a much more common experience lies in the realm of relationships. Watch this little clip. DTR. Some of you will recognize what those letters stand for. If you're not sure, let me help you out. If you are a young man in a relationship with a young woman, then uh, chances are these letters are enough to strike fear into your heart. You may run away from, postpone, you may dread the DTR talk. Some young men will even terminate a relationship if they feel like the DTR talk is imminent. It is that official talk that takes place in every romantic relationship. Do you know what it stands for, DTR? Define the relationship. You sit down and you decide where things are going. Have things moved from casual to committed? I remember this uh, date I went on in high school. On the very first date, the girl tried to have the DTR talk with me. First date, DTR. I got out of their PDQ. I just ran away. How many of you can relate to what Pastor Kyle's saying there? For Mindy and I, it was me that wanted to have the DTR talk. 
We'd only known each other for a little over a week. We hadn't even officially started dating yet, and I was all ready to tie the knot. The first day I met her, we met at a child, child advantage of the fellowship day camp. She was a teacher's aide, and I was, was doing all kinds. I was the gopher. I was you know, running to town for supplies and bringing them back and moving tables around as they needed. We did it down at the park, and they had a train. They gave kids train rides on. And we met the first day of the day camp, and I went home the first day. And my mom said, how did it go today? And I said, great. I met the girl I'm going to marry. I'm getting ready to start my senior year of high school. Mindy's getting ready to start her junior year of high school. And my mom said, okay. I knew this was it. I didn't have to be talked into it. I didn't need to date. I knew God told me this is it. This is who you're going to spend your life with. And so a week after knowing her, I called her up on the phone. And I said, I think I'm falling in love with you. Actually, I sh should have said I know I am, but you know, I didn't want to be that bold. I said, I think I'm falling in love with you. If I'm not... You'd better set me straight really quick before I get into this too deep. And Mindy wanted to run. No. Her exact words back to me were, I don't know you well enough. Can we just be friends? Well, that was pretty clear. She knew where I stood. I knew where she stood. We defined the relationship. She's happy for now just to be friends. I wanted more. That's okay. She needs to get to know me better. So we'll stay friends. So we started hanging out. We did things. She invited me to Young Life at her school. I started going to Young Life with, with her a little bit. We did some, some sports games together. I even went to the Pasco football game and sat on the Pasco side when they were playing my team, Richland, because I wanted to be with her. She wouldn't let me cheer for my team on that side. She was afraid I might get beat up. But we started spending some time together. And pretty soon I thought, okay, she knows me well enough by now. She needed to get to know me better. Now she gets to know me. So again, I wanted to define the relationship. I want to go further with this. And so I said, hey, let's have another talk. Remember when I told you I wanted more than a friendship? I mean, I love being friends with you, but I want more. Can we be more than just friends? And she said, I know you too well. <laughs> she said, you're like a brother. That would be weird. <laughs> now what do you do? I mean, I can get her to know me better, but now she knows me too well. So do I just stop seeing her for a while and start over again? But still, I knew. This is what I want out of a relationship. What she wanted out of a relationship and what I wanted out of a relationship were two different things. But at least we knew where we standed. Now, it's a longer story than that because obviously somehow I finally won her over. And she finally decided I'm ready for more commitment. And we've been now happily married for 36 years. Is that correct? 36. I got it right. I can't even remember how old I am, so, you know. I do know our anniversary. I just don't always do the math for this is 2018, and that was 1982, and doing the, doing the math is not, math was never my strong point in school. There comes a moment where we want to define the relationship. So far, for the next several weeks, we're going to examine our relationships with Jesus. Many of us like the friendship that we have with Jesus, but Jesus wants more. It's like Mindy and I. She was happy being just friends. I said, you know what? I'm happy to be your friend, but I want more. I want to go deeper. Jesus will not force his relationship on us. He stands back and says, what we have is okay, but you know what? I want more. Are you ready? And he keeps asking. He's not going to give up. He's going to keep saying, are you ready yet? Let's have this DTR talk again. I know we've had it in the past. Let's have it again. Are you ready yet? Can we take this to a deeper level? Jesus doesn't want to be just best friends. He wants us to be all in. Some of us need to have the DTR talk with Jesus. 
Maybe we first need to have a talk with ourselves. What do we want our relationship with Christ to look like? Are we content just to be friends? Or do we want more? Let's define the relationship. Last week we talked about the difference between having Christ as Lord and having him as Savior. We first accept him as Savior, but he wants the relationship to go deeper than that. His desire is that we would give him everything and make him Lord of our life. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He doesn't want just part. He wants all. That's full commitment. That's all in. God doesn't want a part-time relationship. He wants us to give him everything. I think many of you welcome the DTR talk. Because you're ready to move to a different level of commitment. You're ready to move past the casual, past the convenient, into something more devoted, something more committed. You're 100% ready to ask this question, what do I want out of this relationship with Jesus? Some of you, on the other hand, like the relationship you have right now. You like the fact that your sins have been forgiven, and you like someone that you can bring your problems to when you have problems, but you want to keep him just out there, just close enough that you can contact him when you need him, but not where he's going to get involved in your everyday affairs. You even kind of like church. It gives you something to do on the weekend. And most of your friends are here. It's nice to have something that friends can do together, right? You're happy with the relationship you have right now. And this idea of being more committed, you're not so sure you like the sound of that. So we start, oop, next page. Maybe you even go into the fight or flight response. Meanwhile, Jesus is standing back waiting. He knows what you want out of a relationship. He doesn't even have to ask you because he reads your minds. He really knows. The question is more for you, so you can solidify it. What do you want? Jesus says, let's have this talk. What do you want out of this relationship? It's time for us all to ask the question, where do I stand in my relationship with Jesus? Am I ready to go all in? In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Pastor Kyle said that in the, in the video earlier, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So we're going to ask the question for the next several weeks. Am I ready to take up my cross? Am I ready to deny myself? Am I ready to give it all up? We're going to be asking the question using the words, Am I a fan or a follower? Do, do I just like Jesus or am I totally committed? Am I following him? Some of you are saying, well, why would you even ask that? Aren't we all followers of Jesus? Isn't that what a Christian is? Is somebody that follows Jesus? Well, that's what a Christian should be. But we all know people who aren't truly following Jesus. So don't jump to your conclusion too quickly. Don't just automatically say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Let's go through this together and let's let Jesus talk to us. I'm not going to tell you whether or not you're a fan or a follower. That's something you have to decide. That's something I want you to open yourself to the Spirit and let Jesus talk to you and let Him reveal it to you. I'm not going to give you the answer. But will you at least ask the tough questions? Will you at least be open and let Jesus speak to you? The word fan is defined as an enthusiastic admirer. We're all fans of different things. Many of us are sports fans. We watch the games. We cheer on the team. Some of us even have jerseys of our favorite players. We understand the concept of being a fan of sports. I'm afraid that our churches have potential to very easily become stadiums full of fans. But Jesus never cared about having fans. If you define a fan as an enthusiastic admirer, then fans weren't important to him. I think many Christians, and I use that word loosely because Christian actually means Christ-like. Can we really say we are like Christ? Many Christians have a tendency to come together once a week and be fans of Jesus. 
It's no different than going to the football game with friends or going to the basketball game with friends. We're just coming together, and we're all there together saying, Yay, Jesus! And then just like we leave the football game, we leave this stadium, and we go back to our normal life until next week when we can come back and do it all over again. We come in, we sit in our seats, and we open our program to see what's being offered. We applaud when we like something, and we gripe when things don't go the way we want. We get in the car, and on the way home, we evaluate the sermon. We give the song selection a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and then we come back next week, and we do it all over again. As long as the pastor and the church keep performing well enough to keep us happy, we're on board. But if things don't go the way we want, we start looking for another team to root for, another church to invest in. We can feel pretty good about ourselves because we all know about Jesus. We've memorized the playbook. We know the vocabulary. We're great admirers of Christ and what he does. But Jesus never cared about having fans. So, for those of you that are ready to have the DTR talk, for those that are ready to search your hearts and to allow Jesus to search your heart and start talking to you about this, there are three questions we need to answer. Question number one, why are you here? And underneath that I put, why, what do you want out of the relationship? What are you expecting to get out of this relationship with Jesus? If you read through the Gospels, Jesus at different points in his ministry would draw a line in the sand. And he would separate the fans from the followers. One such instance is in John chapter 6. Jesus is in the height of his ministry here on earth. And we read that large crowds were following him. He was very popular. He was working miracles. He was providing food from just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. A lot of people were in the crowd following Jesus. I mean, if we judge him on earthly success, he was very successful. He had multitudes. He had more people coming after him than anybody alive at that time. But Jesus knew why they were coming. In verse 2, it says, The people were coming because of the miracles. You can read that for yourselves. It says, Many people were coming to him because of the miracles he performed. The main reason the crowds were showing up was either because Jesus put on a great show and they wanted to see it, or because they needed a miracle in their own lives and they expected Jesus to do something for them. They didn't really care about his teaching or about the life changing he could give them. They were simply there for the show and how it made them feel. So why do you come every Sunday? What's your because? Is it simply because it's habit? I was raised that way and I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't in church on Sunday because that's the way I was raised? Is it because you feel guilty if you're not there? Oh, shame on me, I'm not in church. Is it because all your friends are here? So it's your one time each week to reconnect? Is it because you like the music? Why is it that you come? What is it you expect to get out of this relationship with Jesus? At some point, you need to define the relationship. So Jesus, knowing why the people are following him, challenged his fans to a deeper, more intimate relationship. And in verse 66, we read this. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? Because they realized Jesus wanted more than they were willing to give. So they stopped following him. They didn't want to have the DTR talk. They didn't want to go deeper. A lot of them went home because what Jesus was offering. What he wanted out of the relationship wasn't what they wanted. Jesus still wants the same kind of relationship from his followers today. It might be time for some people to just go home because they're coming to Jesus for the wrong reasons. They're only interested in Jesus for what he can do for them. He's simply their fire insurance policy or their personal genie. They just want to be close enough that Jesus can rescue them when they're in trouble. Jesus is saying, let's define the relationship. Why are you here? 
for Jesus, his because is that he wants to have a deep relationship with us. That's his because. He wants to know us personally. He wants to be connected to us in a deep way. He doesn't want to be just an acquaintance. He wants to be involved in every aspect of our lives. So the first question we ask is, why am I here? The second question, am I all in? Being a follower of Jesus requires complete commitment. A follower of Jesus will do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. They're absolutely loyal, completely committed. On the whole, we don't do too well with absolute commitment, do we? I think we prefer selective commitment. Simply put, we customize Christianity. Oftentimes, we look at a relationship with Jesus and say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to pick and choose which areas I follow him in. We say, I'll follow Jesus, but don't ask me to forgive the person that hurt me. I'm not going to let go of that resentment. I deserve being angry. I deserve that unforgiveness in my heart. But Jesus says if we're going to follow him, if we're going to be fully committed, we have to be willing to forgive. In fact, he says if we can't forgive others, he can't truly forgive us. So we can't say I'm going to follow Jesus, but I won't forgive. It's not an option. We say I'll follow Jesus, but don't expect me to give anything. I work hard for that money. That's my money. Don't expect me to give any of it to Jesus. I'll follow him, but no. I'm not giving. I'll follow Jesus, but don't tell me to give up anything. I like that habit. I know it may not be good for me, but, you know, that's just something I enjoy doing. So I'll follow Jesus, but I'm not stopping that. That's part of me. I'll follow Jesus as long as it doesn't require more than one hour a week. Don't expect me to take him to the job with me. Don't expect him to take him to school with me. Don't, don't let service go a minute over that because I follow Jesus one hour and that's it. That's all the time I have for Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus, but that's not going to stop me from getting what I want. If I want it, I'm going for it. And I don't care what Jesus said. He can't have that area of my life. I'll follow Jesus, but only in the areas I'm comfortable with. If there's something that makes me uncomfortable, I'm not going there. And it's not right for Jesus even to ask that of me. If Jesus really loved me, he'd love me the way I am, and he'd let me do whatever I want to do. I'm a Christian, but I'm not all in. Well, if you're not all in, you're not a full follower of Jesus Christ. You're just a fan. There's not an option in God's economy for selective commitment. It's not a possibility. There's no bargaining or bartering, no finagling. When you decide to become a follower of Christ, you've got to go all in. And fans don't like the idea of going all in. They're not wild about having to make sacrifices or about having to deny themselves of something that they desire or crave. Well, if you answered the first question, then you probably have already answered the question whether or not you're all in. If you aren't here for the right reasons, chances are you won't be willing to go all in either. But even those who do want more out of the relationship with Jesus sometimes struggle to give up certain things that they know they need to give up in order to have that deeper. I want that deeper commitment, but I just can't give that up. And Jesus says, until you can give that up, you can't truly be my follower. I want it all. Number three, after why am I here and am I all in? Have you made it your own? Many of us started going to church because of a parent. Mom made you. Dad said you had to. There wasn't an option. Or maybe you started coming because a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse. 
You come because they like it when you come. And if they're happy, you're a lot happier. So I will go just because they want me to go and it keeps them from bugging me. Okay, I went to church with you on Sunday, okay? Can you just get off my case? You come because it appeases someone else. For those of us who grew up in the church or who attended church in order to appease a significant other or a relative, it can be easy to become a fan. It's like riding in the car with someone who listens to a different type of music than what you prefer. They drive you to school or to work every day, and since it's their car, you put up with their style of music. But it's really not your style. But eventually, a few of the songs start to grow on you. You know, it's not as bad. I thought I hated this kind of music, but yeah, there are actually some songs that aren't too bad. And pretty soon you catch yourself humming along when the song comes on. And then one day you find yourself actually singing the words. It started to grow on you a little bit. But it's still not your go-to music. You're a fan. I'm starting to like it. I can kind of put up with this, and I can even have a smile on my face while I'm listening to this instead of grumbling inside myself. This is okay. But you're still just a fan. You're not fully committed. It's nothing you would do on your own, only when you're with someone else. This can happen to us in church. We keep coming to appease someone else, and pretty soon we get into the flow of things. We know most of the songs, and we even recognize the stories or teachings. We kind of become fans of Jesus. But that can be the most dangerous situation to be in. If your faith isn't your own, if you aren't pursuing a relationship with Jesus, and you keep coming week after week and begin to create a faith that was someone else's faith, you're just numbing yourself to the real thing. You'll become numb to a real faith. You'll be comfortable with a few songs and a few favorite verses, none of it which requires personal commitment or personal sacrifice. You have to make the faith your own. Jesus isn't looking for a relationship between you and your mom and him. He's looking for a relationship between you and him. He doesn't want your relationship to be through someone else. He wants it to be, to be direct, you and him. That might be one of the reasons that Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, we know Jesus didn't really want us to hate our mothers and fathers and hate our brothers and sisters and hate our children but in comparison to our love for him see if we're putting our relationship with somebody else before a relationship with him we're not all in he says you need to love me more love them yes but when we love him the way we should it helps us to love those people more see so if we can learn to put them aside and say my number one commitment is Jesus Christ he is my first love I am pursuing that relationship then he filters that down and then all of a sudden we find out that unforgiveness that we had it starts going away because his love starts flowing with us and all of a sudden we realize you know what I wasn't really ready completely to give up that unforgiveness but it's gone because I've developed that relationship with Jesus Christ this isn't about what your mom and dad want or your spouse wants or your parents want, grandparents want. It's not about what Pastor Jerry wants. This is about you and Jesus. You know what Jesus wants. Do you want the same thing that he wants? This morning we've just begun to scratch the surface of the question as to whether or not we're fans or followers. Already a few of you are a little bit uncomfortable. God's beginning to dig up some areas in your life that you buried a long time ago. You were comfortable having them buried. But now they're coming up to the surface and you got to start dealing with them. I mean, you don't want to deal with those things. You just want to put them back down again. But now that they're there, now that Jesus has exposed them, what are you going to do? It's time to define the relationship. You can either run and ignore the question, or you can have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Jesus. 
sort it out. I hope you'll join us tonight as we dig in deeper because we're going to continue with this question. Define the relationship. What does Jesus want and what do I want? Is it the same thing? And once again, I'm not going to be giving you the answers. It's for you and Jesus. I just want to provide the questions so you can start asking those questions and let Jesus speak to your heart. Are you ready for something more? Jesus wants something more. Are you really ready to be a completely committed follower of Jesus Christ?